So thanks once again for coming. Um, just a few quick announcements. So I don't know if you noticed, uh, I just posted a Netflix talk. It's going to happen at the end of the month. Uh, it's going to be in uh, Playa Vista at the uh, space of uh, uh, Team One Advertising. So please feel free to go to that one. Uh, next thing is our Biggie Daddy Ali, you know, again. And on this conference, the free conference, we once a year, which is July 9. Uh, we're looking for uh, talks. If you want to submit a talk, if you want to work with you, or if you're talking in more SQL data science, you know, please feel free to submit a talk. Or, yeah, submissions are open to the end of April, so it'd be great to have uh, some very good opportunity for come and talk on, you uh, know, doesn't have some of the other uh, uh, products they're working on. Uh, with that, I want to uh, quickly introduce uh, John Rich. So John is the co-founder and CTO of uh, Spice Machine. So I want to thank John for coming and presenting today. A uh, few quick logistics before you get started. Uh, we have t-shirts out there, so if you want, please speak to me about that. And uh, just at the end of this, uh, if you don't mind, uh, you could just uh, put the chairs back in place. I have a picture of the, uh, how the table should be set up. So we're going to help with that. It takes about less than a few minutes since there's such a large group, so that helps out quite a bit. So, uh, with that, I just want to call you John, call upon John again, and thanks for saying that to Factual for helping us out uh, our horses around. So, round of applause for Factual and uh, round before John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me in the back? Good. All right, great. Um, well, thank you. Um, so, people always ask me, what, what even is Splice Machine? And especially like in the big data world, people give talks saying about all their successes. And um, Splice Machine was actually born out of my failures. Um, so, about four or five years ago, I was working with one of the world's largest retailers, one of the world's largest product companies, and uh, one of the largest biotech companies in the world. And I was doing their initial forays into big data and Hadoop. And although as technologists we were working really hard to try to solve those problems in Hadoop at that, that period, um, they ultimately, from a business perspective, took too long. The applications that could run on it were way too simple for what the business expected. Um, and there was kind of a disconnect there. So where the business was thinking they could run their marketing applications on Hadoop, or they could run their supply chain on Hadoop and do a project in three to four months to get that working. Uh, the, the technology reality was, well, we have to rewrite everything, rewrite all the applications, do all of this. And it didn't work, unfortunately. And my key insight from that experience was that, in some sense, the market was looking at Hadoop as a database, and it was actually a file system. And there was just this disconnect. And it sucked. It sucked for the people who worked with me because we couldn't deliver the value we wanted. Um, and it bothered me uh, a lot. So I thought, well, what does the Hadoop space actually need? And what it needs is a database. It needs a database that can actually run real applications. And that's simply what we did at Splice Machine. We built a relational database that can, with all the features of a relational database, that run on top of the Hadoop. Um, this talk, I'll talk briefly about kind of what we do at Splice, but then I'll move into kind of how we've adopted Spark over the last two and a half years, <coughs> give you some innovative stuff that we've done, and hopefully just have a nice open discussion. If you have questions at any time, just yell out and, um, or raise hand or whatever, and um, we, can, we can interact that way. So what do people do with Splice Machine? What kind of applications am I, am I talking about? Our initial early adopters were mostly digital marketing because they're generally people uh, with large data sets. They're early adopters of technology. <laughs> also financial services for fraud detection. The commonality here is really large amounts of data, quick concurrency where things are being updated and deleted and moved around, uh, and people running analytics on top of that data while that data movement is occurring. Uh, some supply chain optimization, life sciences around storing genetic information. 
Uh, we commissioned one report that was kind of fascinating for me. Um, so there's a huge disconnect right now out, out in the market where most people look at data that's over a day old. And in most companies anymore, that just does not work. So for financial services, doing reports on data that's a day old, well, that doesn't catch if a trader is doing something incorrect. It doesn't check any sort of problem that's occurring. Likewise, in retail, you know, there's a few days of the retail calendar that are really, really important. Um, so if it's a Black Friday or something like that, you want your report as of a few minutes to understand what's going on uh, in your business. So these things just weren't working. And, and this is the challenge um, the database community is getting attacked with right now. Um, this is really no longer acceptable. So people have this concept that now what I want to be able to do is run my analytics on real-time data. And I want to be able to have applications that can access tremendous amounts of data. Um, I said a few these kind of set, set the tone. Um, so what's the problem? Most companies have somewhat of a, a setup like this, where you have a bunch of databases out there for transactional systems. Uh, you've got a team of people in the back room writing ETL scripts and, and doing those sorts of things, and translating that data to a data warehouse or, and an operational data store for operational reporting. Uh, then you probably put it in some sort of columnar store for read-only analytics, and you run your, your queries. Um, the problem is all areas of this are under stress right now. So data is growing at 50%, budgets are at 3%. So when you talk to an executive, they'll say, well, I can't afford this, I can't afford this, I can't afford this, and they're all growing. And the challenge with Hadoop, when it was introduced, is they said, awesome, I can replace, start replacing some of this. And in actuality, when it was first introduced, it basically became another bucket down here, and they called it the big data team, and they hired a few people, and, and they put Hadoop over here. And they take some data out of here, but in essence, they really didn't change the dynamics of problem that's going on in the market. So this was kind of some of the problems I was originally trying to solve with some of the larger, you know, larger data users out there. Um, does that make sense to everybody? Is that kind of the world we're living in? Um, so database people said, hey, you know what, Nirvana. We're going to be able to run our, our transactional app applications and our analytical applications in a single data platform. So we're not going to be moving data around all over the place. Um, and we'll use resource management to try to keep straight these different workloads. Um, and there's been some really nice products put out in this. So you've got like Oracle Exadata, for example, is a product that uh, focuses on resource management for both running transactions and analytical processing. Uh, SAP HANA is another product that's been engineered to try to do that uh, sort of workload. And it's Splice Machine. Um, our initial focus for the first two years of the company was building that transactional piece, more this side of the business. And then we used Spark to be able to handle uh, this side for the analytical process. And that's what I'll talk about tonight, and some, like I said, some of the lessons we learned through that. So, real quick, this is kind of our focus. We initially focused on SQL. And where we were unique in the Hadoop ecosystem is we built a transactional system on top of HBase. So it has to comply with database uh, on top of that. And our focus is really about being able to scale out affordably, make it elastic. We want it to be about 10 to 20 times faster than traditional relational databases. Um, and we wanted to be able to support mixed workloads. And that's really where Apache Spark came in for us. I'll give you an example of a customer, and then we can get into like the stuff we learned about, about Spark. So this is one of our first customers, Hart Hanks. Uh, they use Oracle uh, as their database, and it ran uh, Unica, Abinicio, and Cognos. So Unica is a campaign management tool that does kind of real-time updates and things of that nature. And it also does um, you know, your campaign segmentation, real-time event, <laughs> campaign management. So, and your normal SQL-based application, Abinicio is an ETL tool, so that's where they're doing their transforms, deduplication, uh, different kind of matching criteria. And then you had Cognos, which could be you know, MicroStrategy, Tableau, any sort of BI tool. It's focused on executing queries and doing kind of your run-of-the-mill reports and, and business intelligence. 
So they had that, and it was surrounded by Oracle. These were the problems they identified. An Oracle rack for them was too expensive based on their business model. Uh, the queries were running too slow, even so I'm up to like a half an hour. And their problem was the classic problem, right? We want more data, and they run this for other companies. So other companies wanted to put more and more data in it, uh, but it was getting more and more expensive. And that, that obviously wasn't work for them. Um, and what we did is splice machine was pretty simple. Um, we just took out the Oracle bit, exported out of Oracle, loaded it into a splice machine, um, you know, both imported it, and then we could run the existing SQL in the Unica. So we had like 10,000 different lines of SQL that they issued, but we could run that type of SQL. So that makes sense. Really, our play is trying to uh, support workloads that traditionally you would need a relational database for, whether it's Postgres, MySQL, or Oracle. Uh, anything like that. Yep. Everybody kind of get that. I mean, pretty simple concept. So, like you said, our initial foray was really building this around HPS. Yes, sir. Yeah. It's a good question. We haven't implemented any of the geospatial yet. Um, that we just haven't had that demand yet for it. Um, but I, I think it's on our roadmap for early next year. Um, but it's not something we've we focused on. We haven't actually had a customer said that's something that they, that they wanted. So we try to be pretty disciplined about the, the pieces we build. Yeah. So one of the biggest challenges, even with our first product, is a challenge. Traditional databases, well, you've got these analytical queries that are running, and you have transactional queries. So what happens, this is a very simplistic diagram, you have these semis, which are your large analytical queries. And what happens is they block out all your transactional so when your transactional queries are running, they're running five, 10 milliseconds, everything's happy, and Billy runs a report, and then all of a sudden, my five to 10 milliseconds come, become 40 to 45 milliseconds. It affects web views or uh, responsiveness of applications to mobile devices, those sorts of things. So as Splice Machine, our strategy is pretty simple. We wanted to use HBase in the case of transactional processing, uh, and use Spark as a data flow engine for analytical processing. I'll go in and drill into a bit deeper. Ultimate goal is this. With traditional RDBMSs, the old P response time is heavily affected by your analytical load increasing. We want that to stay fine. That was our objective. So how do we go about even doing this? And I'll start going back to layers and then we can get a nice discussion going. So the first thing when we started the company, we said, well, how are we going to do this? We don't have half a billion dollars to do that. Um, and to build a database, you know, people built these over 10 to 20 years. So we thought, well, let's do a little jujitsu here. Let's take the strengths of things that are out there and see what we can put together. So the first thing we did was Apache Derby. We took that. Uh, it's a Java-based database, totally unscalable. But it has a great parser. So it would generate from SQL and abs uh, abstract syntax tree. Uh, both Oracle and IBM would use it internally for some like lightweight test frameworks and stuff like that. Um, so it's pretty impressive. So like I said, Java-based, it gave us ODBC and JDBC compliance, so we didn't have to kind of focus on that piece, which was a, a lot of fun. Um, and it also had a ton of tests already cooked in, so we didn't have to hire a QA team to spend two years developing SQL compliance tests. They were already done. Um, so that was advantageous for us. Second, what do you want as your storage layer? So ultimately, we wanted to pick some sort of key value store. And what was important to us is um, we needed a consistent key value store. So if you're going to run an application, you write data, and boy, when you read it, it better than the data you wrote. Because if it isn't, an application doesn't know how to grok, uh, like eventual consistency and stuff like that. Generally, SQL applications um, can't understand, understand these concepts. Um, so, in, we picked HBase, uh, the big thing for me is, and we preserved this through everything we did, and I'll show you some ways we use Spark to, to help us, but we wanted to have auto shard <coughs> so data grew, split, and, and you know, maintain those sorts of capabilities. We wanted reasonably high availability, and it had a scalable proof point with Facebook and a couple other vendors that had scaled it into the petabytes, which made us feel a little more comfortable. Uh, about where that technology is at. And lastly, like I said, about two and a half years, we got into Apache Spark. And our strategy there was pretty simple. 
Um, HBase is not an analytical engine. HBase is, in some sense, terrible for running analytical queries. Um, so we thought, so we thought, well, you know, let's not do that. Uh, let's use something that's a data flow engine that's, that's optimized for analytical queries. And the thing that really was nice is um, in Spark the concept of lineage and that a uh, RDD can recompute a specific task and go back to the data it needed for each step. So what you do is multi-way joins. If, if a node goes down or a task fails, it's smart enough to understand what, what's the data I need to be able to And for us as a transactional database, since we have timestamps on each of those tasks, when it rereads the data, it's not like it changes. It always gets a consistent data. So it's really nice. You can run these really large running queries, and data can be you know, in flight underneath it, but you get a consistent view of the data. So it was really exciting for us. Uh, something that was really pretty passionate about. And it was a spark um, talk up. I'll give you just a little bit about HBase so everybody understands how does this thing work. Um, it's a key value store based on a log structured merge tree. So um, these are kind of an interesting structure. They're nice for heavy writes. So the way it works, a write comes in. It's put into an ordered skip list, and then it's um, durably written and appended to a write ahead log. So that's the, the D uh, in ACID, the durability guarantee. So it appends the write ahead log. The write ahead log is on HDFS, so it's replicated to other nodes. And you still have this skip list that's in memory with the sorted set. So if you're issuing scans, you're going against the files, and you're going against this in memory sorted list. When the list that's in memory gets too big, to, you know, eventually it's going to get too big, right? So it gets to a big thing, it's flushed. And what does a flush mean? It actually writes a sorted file, an index sorted file. So when you want to read data, you read from the, the skip list that's in memory, and you merge that with the files that are already there. So this is the LSM model. Um, Cassandra's a, a similar model of this. Um, and like I said, why is this advantageous? Why well, you do high write? Any questions here? I added this just to say kind of how our marketing team talks about Spark um, and how they kind of promote Spark. So the big reason why you know people are generally excited about Spark, uh, they had a really nice petabyte sort. Um, <coughs> we really tout the advanced in memory technology. What that really means is the ability to still do this. That's not an easy process to try to build. So that's one of the things that we tout about being able to use Spark. Uh, the active community and obviously the machine learning libraries, which aren't which aren't huge. Uh, most machine learning libraries are a lot more if you think like SAS or uh, a lot of different companies, but it's it's getting to be credible. There's more and more people coming in. All right, so now let's get to technology. So why how is Spark actually doing anything at Splice Machine? Um, so we had problems from our initial release. As all software engineers, when you Get your first product out, you realize, ooh, that didn't work like it was supposed to, and we have problems. So here were our problems. Um, HBase had this thing called a compaction. So I showed you the nice LSM tree where it wrote the data out, but eventually you get so many of these files, they have to be merged back together to be a single file. And that merge process um, had a bunch of interesting characteristics. The files would be loaded into HBase, causing memory pressure. Um, the I.O. was not balanced against anything else, so it didn't understand that it was burning so much I.O. to do the compaction versus somebody running a query or anything like that. There's no resource management concept at all. Um, and then inside the, the Hadoop file system, it actually would block. The input stream would block. So while that compaction was running, in essence, you really couldn't get, get to data quickly. So all this really sucked. Um, and how bad did it suck? Um, I would have to go to customers and say, hey, you know what? You're running an OLTP system, and we think we can get it, that query back to you in like six or seven seconds, unless it's a compaction, and then that may take 25 seconds. Yeah, so it's, you know, sometimes you can say plus or minus 20%. The reality in the LSM trees when it's on heat, it gets even worse. So that was a, oh, God, problem for us. Now, how do we solve it? So the problem here is two, uh, multifold, right? So first, um, the file system on the same Java JVM would block. Okay, well we got to get it off the Java JVM clearly, right? 
that same process can't run. Uh, the I.O. was not controlled at all or prioritized. That told, told me that it has to run in a different process so that then the operating system can, can measure which process wants what resources and use like I.O. nice and, and low level OS tuning to be able to say which process gets what resources. Um, so that was, and then third, it didn't understand what else was going on in the cluster. So how should, you know, if, if nobody's running any queries on the cluster, run a bunch of compactions. That's great. Um, but if the, you know, if there's some urgent report that has to get out by 8 o'clock that's really heavily prioritized, well, maybe slow down on your compaction process. You don't have time for it. And I had really no, no understanding whatsoever of that. So for people who use Spark, what did we do? We, we cheated. Um, we said, you know what? When we're ready to run compaction, we'll just let HBase behave like a state engine. When it says, I want to compact, when you want to load those seven files and make them one file, you can do that in Spark. Okay? And you can submit it in its own job group, and then we did the resource schedule, and I'll show you that, how we started scheduling resources between the two. We said, go do it there. Um, stop screwing up our transactional system. And what was really cool, um, and I can even post some code around this, I didn't know how the ability to interact with the Spark UI, I didn't know you could change a lot of the UI's look and feel. So for us, it was really cool because we could change what was actually showing up in the UI, and we could say, okay, I'm running a minor compaction, and I'll actually say minor compaction of this index, oh, and by the way, you know, in this case, you're taking 242 megs of files, and there's five of them to create one. And it'll also tell us how long it took, how much memory it used, everything. So that was a really, that's a problem that is literally, in some sense, frustrated the HBase community since conception. And it's an example of where using an analytical engine can actually help a key value store um, perform appropriately. So I thought that was kind of novel how we did that, to be honest. I thought it was something where we had a problem and we said, well, you know, there's this other really nice software product. Can we use it to try to solve that problem? And then you get records of what actually happened, right? So you know how long it took, uh, when it ran, how long was the delay for it to run. Does that make sense to everybody? It was just a kind of trying to solve a problem there, right? How's that, how's that affect so so what we ended up doing is we used the dynamic um, out so spark has a and I'm gonna blank on the actual setting as a dynamic allocation so we run it through spark on yarn because uh, the platform companies we worked with said they would not certify us going forward um, because mm -hmm. They're really focusing the um, to do it on Yarn so that they could have Kerberos and all those things that they've already built for Yarn. They wouldn't have to redo it for like standalone Spark and stuff like that. So they kind of gave us that signal and said, look, guys, a year from now, that's not going to be a supported platform. Don't go there. We heavily suggest you do you know, Spark on Yarn. And then what we do is we do dynamic allocation of executors. So uh, one of the problems we had initially with our product is we had you know, HBase and it had maybe a 30 meg or 30 gig you know, JVM or whatever. Um, but if somebody gave us a you know quarter terabyte of memory on a node, we really couldn't use all of it. And if they had 50 disks, you know, we surely couldn't use all of that, right? But with Spark, we can actually, you know, as long as Yarn understands what resources are available to it, you can spin out executors across the cluster. And actually, we can heat up those type of boxes, which was really cool for us. Because that was a huge frustration initially. Like, oh man, we've got these great huge boxes that someone you know, threw over the wall to us, but we really can't use them. Um, and Spark helped us actually use those boxes. Hopefully that answers your question. But we're really using yarn to spin up executors. The executor is not the complete um, complete amount of usage of the of that node. It usually is, you know, can do like four or five tasks at least. Spin them up and you get multiple ones on each node. So that's kind of what we do. Now we had a whole other bunch of problems. So we started saying, well, what else can Spark do? We knew we had to read from HBase um, to read this data. But we also know 
no one successfully has read from David from HBase and performed them. You can go HBase Hive slow and Google it, and you'll have like 4,000 results, and you go, okay, that's not going to work for us, right? Um, so we said, look, one innovative thing we said is, why not, instead of doing a remote procedure call to HBase and retrieving all the data from another Java process to another Java process, which is extremely slow, why don't we read the files directly from HDFS? Well, but then there's you know, that data that's in flight in the mem store, and you're going to miss that, so you're not going to have a consistent database, right? Well, we do have a transactional system, so we know, you know what data to look at. So what we did was say the following. When we issue queries, um, we issue a scan and tell it, hey, we're attending to scan this data. We go directly at the store files, and we only pull across the deltas from the mem store. So that we don't pull everything across from the HBase. So when I run a little query, I don't want to knock HBase over. I want HBase just to kind of act like it's not doing anything. And if there's a few data sets that have been updated, I want to merge those in so I still get a consistent view so the application um, knows what's in there. And I wanted to avoid the slower HBase API. So really what we've built is our own input-output formats that are optimized to read directly from um, store files in HBase. They go directly against the file system, and most of that is short circuit reads. So then your, your OS can do I.O. scheduling, which is really powerful. Um, so now HBase, based on its, its, its scores, and Spark, based on its scores, can have different, um, different scheduling at the OS level of I.O. and CPU. Second thing we wanted to do is um, in a database, the big thing is to be able to generate bytecode uh, to do things like projections and calculations. So oh, that you, yeah. yes? What do you handle um, the memory constraints between HBase and Spark? Are they residing on the same nodes? Or... They are residing on, because you, you need, ultimately you're going to have to have some sort of locality concept, right? Okay. And you're going to want your Spark workers ultimately to be able to run on that. What do you want on memory logs? Uh, I'm sorry, what? What do you want on memory logs? Um, well, HBase is a, mostly a memory hog because people try to run analytics on HBase, right? So HBase's problem is the Hadoop community had this, this HBase thing. It's really for uh, transactional, not transactional process, but low latency queries, right? Um, the problem is the Hadoop community only had HDFS and these kind of query engines that ran against files. And quite naturally, people said, well, I want to update data. Well, how do I update it? Oh, throw it into HBase. But then when you tried to get it out of HBase, it was so slow. And yes, if you take HBase and you try to read two terabytes of data, that's an extremely destructive process. And you're right, you have to have this memory hog, and you have all kinds of issues. If you use HBase as what it's supposed to be for, which is gets, puts, scans, uh, quick range scans, things of that nature, it actually behaves quite well on the HBase side. Um, on the Spark side, I'll, I'll be honest with you, we don't do a lot of... Um, Specifically, we, we don't do a lot of unconstrained RDD caching. So that's what generally kills Spark users. They say, this runs slow. Well, what am I going to do? I am going to cache it all in memory. Well, that's great, but you have to have understanding of, you know, if you're caching stuff in memory and I'm caching stuff in memory and she's caching stuff in memory, all of a sudden you run out of that. So you start to have these sorts of weird problems. Um, and we don't do a lot of that. We try to, we try to make it be somewhat to where even if it has to spill the disk consistently, that's okay for us. Uh, we've been using a lot of the tungsten optimization for them yeah. lately in Spark, and I can talk to some of that. But um, I, I'm better, if it, even if it's a little bit slower, if it's consistently a little bit slower, that's okay for me. At least I can then tune towards it versus things that are really fast and then just fall off a cliff. That drives people crazy. Yes, Speaking of things that are known or unknown. Yeah, writing your own input output formats to stuff that sits on the HBase. Are those documented structures or are you just reaching into the innards and your subject? No, they're no, they're pretty open. So they have an API at the um, at the region server level. So any I should say at the region level. At any region you can just say open store files and point to the directory of the store files in HDFS. It'll grab it. Now it doesn't know the mem store, right? So that's why we had this stuff run across. That's a, a defined API. Uh, in the HBase community, and they're one that's relatively supported, um, even across people who are kind of mocking HBase, like 
doing some sort of H base type crawling in the C structure. So that's still there. That's a good question. Second challenge um, databases have is obviously you've got to generate the time code. But that's just saying your quick projections, quick calculations. Um, you don't want to be doing things like you know some method calls and all, all sorts of things. Because the JVM starts to branch and you get poor cache performance. All these low-level things that you can't really do in a database. So what did we do? Um, we did generate uh, our own universal execution plan and byte. So when we optimize a query, we have a based optimizer with statistics so we were able to generate the query and generate the bytecode for doing things like uh, summing data together and doing projections of data. This, so the architecture is, is pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, you have HBase with the region servers. The region servers have parser plans uh, and optimizers so you issue SQL to the region server using JDBC ODBC. Every node can parse, plan, and execute that. Um, and then you have your region servers uh, that are in H base. And then by a yarn, you have your executors um, for uh, response. Okay. Usually people ask, okay, tell me. Oh, yes. Um, probably the next, next thing you were going to say. Um, thoughts on yarn versus mesos? So our internal challenges with um, Mesos, is when you say Mesos, you're really saying documentation. It kind of go, in most cases, we usually go down that path. Yeah. Right? Um, and the problem we had with Docker was kind of uh, one with, Docker works well with POSIX compliant file systems. Now, Hadoop, unfortunately, is not. Uh, the, the Java-based versions are not POSIX compliant. Kind of nuanced, right? But ultimately, what happened to us is that we couldn't do short circuit reads in each case. Now, that is a problem for us. That's not a nuance. <laughs> That's us reading through the data node versus going directly to Linux files. Yeah. That was a showstopper for us. Uh, there's some products that are um, some initiatives that have come out. Of, Google has a thing called Kubernetes, and they're trying to work through that. Um, MapR file system is positive compliance, so it gives them a little bit of an advantage when running on uh, Mesos with Docker infrastructure. When we were down the Mesos chain, we said, look, we're doing Mesos for the containerization. We did containerization, and then we said, oh, God, ah, fuck. Yeah. yeah, just the performance was too poor. I mean, you, know, you killed the key optimization that you do, which is in the short circuit. So that's kind of our, sorry, just people brutal. That was kind of our, yeah. And we hit that, and we said, okay, once that works itself out, um, we'll, we'll get back to that train. Yeah. So one thing also about that, a lot of the organizations we go into, I don't know if they built out big data groups or what happened, but they bought a ton of nodes of important words, cloud air map or whatever. And they have these 100, 150 node clusters with some files out there. They're not doing a lot per se. Um, but what's interesting is they're saying now, like, look, if you're going to run Splice Machine on that, you need to run it in a Yarn environment. I hear that over and over again. It's, everything has to run in Yarn. Because um, there are some jobs or something that they've written in MapReduce, JPI, whatever. Um, and they want to be able to prioritize that. So we hear that. So we hear a lot about Yarn. Um, we do hear about Mesos from simply advanced customers as well. Okay, so how does this thing even work? SQL comes in, you parse it, you're going to parse and plan it. You'll optimize your query based on your statistics. So you're going to try to have the lowest cost possible. So it'll go through all the different join orderings, uh, different, we call them conglomerates, so whether you want to do the base table or indexes or anything like that. Um, what predicates can be pushed down based on the ordering as well. So we go through a normal uh, optimized phase of an optimizer. Um, then it generates the optimal bytecode. We call it an activation, but it's basically a uh, Java bytecode generated. Um, it can be created and loaded. At that point, you look at the class and you look at the amount of data that you're scanning, and you say, okay, well, what should I do? Um, if it's really small, it's something you can do in maybe 100, 200 milliseconds or less. But we're going to run that in Apache HBase. So we'll run it directly in memory on an HBase node. And we'll do all the, you know, even if it has five nested loop joins or whatever for an old speed query, that's fine. It's going to run the quick piece all in HBase. Um, and you will know, execute the old speed query from the bytecode. We use this block cache and boom filters, things that are really there for. Um, being able to quickly access data, 
uh, things are optimized for transactional processing, and it'll reach out the results. Okay. All right. Well, well, if it's a big query, you know, someone down in the BI department ran a six-way join, and the optimizer looks at it and goes, "Oh my gosh, um, what do we do?" Well, it generates a Spark execution plan. So the SQL that goes into Splice Machine, um, all of our SQL can be converted directly, lazily to basically an RDB. So the entire SQL structure can be here are the instructions for executing it. Uh, we generate that Spark execution plan. We submit it with our bytecode optimization. Um, we usually use fair scheduling with, with, with Yarn, um, the Spark on Yarn, where the executors have a fair scheduling model. And I'll show you some examples of that. Um, we generate the RDB from H files and then stores. We start trying to read the data out of H base. Uh, and we execute the query and we turn the results. So we have, in essence, a dual engine architecture. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. You got it. You got it. You got it. Yeah. So our first two years were triggers, UDFs, uh, foreign keys, um, all of that bits. So we built all those functions. That was our first foray, um, and what we focused on. So yeah, we support triggers. You can run them through Spark. You can run them through um, Splice. Uh, we support foreign keys, all check constraints, all the things that you'd expect from a relational database. Uh, primary key constraints, uniqueness. I have to do with my type check constraints for each of those databases. Yeah, <laughs> that was a because there's no way anybody's going to trust you to build like a, a real business system without that. And that's why Hadoop got always pushed off to the side because they're like, "Well, that's cool, but whoa, you know, there's no way I would." You can't touch money, I can't touch you know, privacy information, can't touch anything. And our strategy is a little different. We said, look, we're gonna focus on transactions first. And for that, was all the RD the best functions. So triggers, uh, procedures, functions, all of those low-level things that are difficult in distributed systems. And that was the thing we focused on as a company. So I think my question was, was it the non-attacking case or attacking that we had when it was compromising or compromising? Good question. So Derby does, in some cases, help us. So for example, the bytecode uh, will have check constraints there, because you don't really have to even look at the data. So what I mean by a check constraint is that this field can only have these three distinct types. Well, the bytecode will be in instrumented to say, hey, ding dong, you put in some characteristic out of those three types, throw an exception, invalid record, you know, throws the appropriate SQL exception. So some of that we got from Apache Derby. Um, on the foreign keys and primary keys, all that stuff we built. Uh, triggers as well we built. Because a lot of that in Derby was a singleton type model. And as you go to being a distributed uh, system, it's a little different. Um, they also were an Aries based system, so they locked a lot for their transactional processing. And we're a snapshot isolation based system, so an MVCC structure. So our transactional model is different. Um, but it was nice having Derby there to kind of say, well, this is a place where transactions should occur. But, oh, by the way, we're going to modernize this about 10 years to kind of a more modern transactional architecture versus a, a lot of this architecture. Yeah. So the, the big thing that we focused on first is, okay, well, we know our initial initial diagram, I promise you, is OLTP versus OLAP. So what are we going to do? We're going to use low-level OS optimizations to know which one should be prioritized over the other. And then you'll say, okay, but even in analytical systems, there's prioritization of different queries and different things that are going on. So in that case, we use Spark and we leaned on their custom resource pools. So when you submit jobs in Spark, you can assign them to resource pools um, and decide what kind of scheduling <coughs> mode you want to be in. In our case, it was a fair scheduling mode. So what we would do is say, look, an urgent query or a query that was labeled urgent, a thousand of those tasks would be performed for every 10 of the import tasks. So we start to be able to configure and let people do that. Does that make sense? Do people use that in Spark for the first I mean, it's a, it's a pretty powerful tool. Um, I know Hadoop has that as well. And then, you know, um, so we lean heavily on that. So even inside the analytical system, we have different scheduling uh, and prioritization. 
<clears throat> that scheduling is determined based upon how you post the query or what's something that happens when you submit the query. Something happens when you submit the query, you tell them what query you want to use. Some of these were functional. So we got like imports, right? So when you're trying to bulk import data, um, there should be certain prioritization to be required. Um, likewise, if you actually just run a regular query, you should know the market query by a hint is urgent. So this is like some sort of ETL pipeline, and then it's got to get done by nine, and everybody goes sideways. So this is something you say, look, do not block these guys. Get them through, get them done, um, and those sorts of things. And then there's like administrative tasks. So like I'm creating an index. Well, you know, if we're creating an index, most of the time that probably doesn't need to be prioritized. But if it's in an urgent ETL pipeline and the queries into this is urgent, maybe that needs to go faster. And our goal there is just to give, you know, give users tools to be able to um, get their stuff through when they need it. Um, the thing that was coolest to me was the Spark UI. Um, because since we could customize it, we could actually put I tried to simplify the SQL so you can actually see it, but you can actually put SQL in. You can see what executors are operating on what SQL, uh, what's going on over time, and you can see all your active and completed jobs. And then we said, oh, well, we're really going to start customizing the hacker on this, right? So this is TPC, this is TPCH query four. Uh, it has a bunch of subqueries and things. So we've unrolled those subqueries like you know analytical systems do. Um, but the cool thing now is you can see, okay, what's completed, what's still running, and what's dependent on what. So, for example, uh, this phase here, that can just start running. It has no dependency to start. It'll start running and, and hashing its data. That guy will start running. But that stage right there is dependent on the first stage completed. So it starts to run its dependency model and its tasks. Um, and it'll show you how much data you read, how many rows you shuffled in each one. So you basically have a real-time... Um, in my mind, kind of explain plan in front of you, and you're seeing it dynamically change. Um, and then I'll show you kind of what we did to really kind of bring out the, the perspective on That makes sense? Yes. It's a question about um, the two slides ago I think, which was about uh, OLTP and um, one more. I'm sorry. One, there we go. Yes. So, when, when I, I see part of this is basically trying to do large scale distribution in the OLTP system. And this is something that I think the traditional relational database vendors have been struggling to some level of success yeah. for a while and some problems. Are you more on the Teradata model where you're literally distributing your data over all the nodes and executing a parallel then because it's on Hadoop versus more what I would think of as the Oracle model where you have rack running all the nodes computing a parallel with the data? Kind of in one central location. Yeah, so we're running on top of HBase on Hadoop. Uh -huh. So by definition, our data is dispersed across the cluster. On all okay. these regions. Um, so yeah, we are actually going out to each of the you know, the regions mm -hmm. and doing those computations. Now, in the case of OLTP, it's a little different. Mm -hmm. So OLTP, if you're trying to run an OLTP query, it's better just to do a remote scan and bring the data over. So mm -hmm. so when you do analytics, take the computation to the data, right? right. On well, OLTP, that doesn't work because the instructions for your computation are bigger than the data. So if you take all those constructions and try to serialize them over the wire, you're in trouble. So in OLTP world, get the remote scans as quick as possible, bring it all back together, perform your relational algebra, and spit it out. So in this OLTP model, all of the execution, for lack of a better word, happens on the node that you're querying against. And it's reading the data back from all the remote nodes wherever the data resides. Um, in the case of complex joins, stuff like that. So you're actually processing on a single node, but you're pulling remote scans from other ones. That's the fastest way to do that. From the analytical side, the instructions and everything are going to spark, and it's, it's, it's actually going out, running on nodes, hopefully where the data is. Now, in some cases, like we're doing, um, you know, not doing, we don't do a lot of locality delays. So if we have a node that has CPU resources, in general, we're pretty okay on the, the network I.O. bit of it. So a lot of times we'll let a server, if it's got CPU resources, pull remotely on that data. But ultimately, most of the data is local when you run it. And this is really the instructions running on the data, which is your kind of classic analytical. So we do a little bit of both. Yeah. Because 
they work better for you know, and that's kind of was our you know, initially you try to do it all in one way and you realize it just doesn't work. They're optimized for different things, um, they have different use cases and requirements. Oh yes. Um, sort of making a step right I use redshift a lot. Yeah. And there's a concept of disk key which actually distributes the data across the sure. rows. So is that even necessary in a system like this? Or we do so sometimes we can you know, depending on how you set up your primary keys and everything, you either can do range scans, where let's say you set up a primary key that's like an ordered type key, so that you would then be split by those range scans. Um, so that'd be kind of your sharding at the H base level, and then inside of those uh, regions, then we do sub splitting for execution model, so that we get like deterministic size blocks to run against. Um, if you do a hash type partitioning, then you can also do that as a partition key. Um, so, you know, you can do both models. Ultimately, the strategy there is to try to figure out how to fan the data out and be able to recollect it. The problem in transactional processing, the ordering is really critical. Um, so in an MPP database, you just want to hash it out, out because you're saying, look, every node, I want every node participating in the query. But for us, in a transactional setting, I don't want to have to hit 30 nodes and check if it has data. I want to be able to go to one node and grab those 10 records uh, quickly. So they're kind of different in that sense. Um, so it's really about the data model. I hope that answered your question. It's a, it's a tricky, tricky bit. Um, so right, so you get this, get this great graph. Um, the part that I was really proud of is, okay, you have that great graph. That doesn't tell you how the database worked, what information the database had, and was trying to be executed. So then we put all the information that's on the explain form, like what the cost was, the number of rows, the cardinality calculations. We actually put that into Spark. And this is something I'd encourage, even if, well, this is great for a relational database, but even if you're running other Spark jobs, the power to put the metadata of what you were doing onto the UI and into the JSON that you can query that keeps a record of what it was that was actually run is really powerful. Because when this query was run, we know that the scan believed it was going to retrieve, let's say, a million rows. That was what drove the optimizer's decisions. Likewise, if you're running a machine learning algorithm or something like that, same thing. You want to show kind of what was the decisioning process, what data went in, what was going on. We also implemented accumulators, which is a nice feature in Spark. Um, so that allows you to have things that basically run on each of the tasks, sum up, and they're submitted when the task completes. And if the task fails, you don't get them. And it'll re rerun them. But ultimately, what it allows us to do is measure how many rows were on the left side of the join, how many were on the right side of the join, those types of information, which is, in my mind, extremely powerful. Uh, so it allows us to kind of see that low level information. And the information you get from Spark is pretty compelling. And it'll tell you your scheduler delay, how long did it take, how long did it take to serialize your instruction set over, uh, how much memory did you use it for, how much garbage collection time was there, uh, what was your input size, this one is you know, five million records, how much did you shuffle, 33 megs of data, how many rooms you got actually. So you get some really interesting information, low level information. Um, we didn't have that before in Splice Machine. It's kind of a black box. You ran the query, and we're like, oh, our optimizer's great. It's running. Or you can run the explain plan, but you really couldn't see interactively what's going on with this. How far are we along with this? How much data is being shuffled around? What's going on? And you could look like in Cloudera Manager or in Bari or something, kind of see the CPU and network, but you never really understand well, what's going on. And this allowed Actually, our customers be able to say, okay, I see what's going on. We're scanning line item, and okay, we're done with that, and we're waiting on this, and I get it. How big is that? Oh, gosh, that's like 300 gigs. Well, why is that? And they can drill in the next thing and go, oh my gosh, that's a billion dollar table? I thought it was 10 minutes. You know, and, and then you start to give people that information, which is really powerful. Um, it's something we, we just didn't have as a company, which is a challenge for us. The other cool thing is we got federated query support. So fancy way of saying uh, we did what's called a virtual table interface um, so that you ran against any data set and you tell me the types of the data that are going to come back. 
Uh, and then we use all the low-level Spark utilities that already existed to read it. So if it's reading Parquet files, text files, unstructured data sets, reading JDBC from other databases, executing queries there. So we used a lot of the low-level Spark bits um, to be able to execute those jobs. That was a big deal for us. So now we went from just being able to run on HBase to where we can look at CSV files, Parquet files, whatever it is, um, and still be able to execute that. So, you know, it's nice. Okay. Then naturally a customer says, well, what about streaming? And you're like, ah, forget it. I don't, I don't know. Jam it in the database and query it. No, no, no. We want to be able to, to, be able to look what's in the stream. Why? And you, know, you go into that why, and then you're like, okay, we should stop that. Um, how do we interact with the stream? And what we decided was, well, if you think about it, Spark streaming has the same concepts of an RDB, of being able to access data. And if we implemented VTI, which we did, it said, here's some data, and here's what it looks like in SQL, like what kind of things are going to come out of it. Well, if we did that, then we could allow people to interrogate JSON or whatever they have in their streaming apps by running SQL. And boy, wouldn't it be cool that you could actually do a join and stuff with data that's persistent in the database, data in the stream. You then you start thinking, oh gosh, we could union the stream with actually the data that's residing in the database and see a complete view. Oh wait, you know, and you even have indexes on the customer, so you can look at customer information there and look at its indexed information in the other table and do quick kind of lambda type concepts where you can see what's the information, what's the value of this customer, those sorts of things. That all of a sudden really started to become very interesting, especially as we go into this kind of internet of things era. So our strategy there is generally, okay, we want durability, so we generally tell people the Kafka and some sort of IQ that's high performant. Um, we like Spark streaming versus like a storm or something like that because we can use the instruction set. We already have that all there. Um, and then we, we write a VTI on top of it. And then at that point, you can run queries against streams. You can do window functions, whatever the heck you want to do. And you can also um, join that with other data that's persisted in the data store. Um, so that was really exciting to us because starting to put together a lot of things that have not been put together and are frustrating because usually someone says streaming and you're kind of like, I don't know. You know I don't, Let's have a team go off and do that for you know a while and build that architecture. And you know, we didn't have like a really good understanding of how to do that. So does that make sense to everybody? Cool. This is some ugly code, so I always I always have to throw code up in any talk I do, so bear with me. Um, so then you're like, well, gosh, you got this SQL database, that's pretty cool. And you know, it gets this unstructured data, great. But um, you know, Spark's really known for having a few really good machine learning libraries. How do I interact with those? And there's different ways. Um, our SQL can return RDDs, so we can try to interact with the Scala client in, in Spark and return kind of an RDD for that. Okay, that's kind of interesting, but how do we operationalize machine learning in Spark? How do we run it against the database? How do we prioritize it? How do we do all these things that are really becoming critical? So, I don't know. Um, so what we did, just as an example, is let's do a procedure. So this is a simple Java procedure. It takes in any SQL you want to submit to the query engine. Um, it executes that SQL lazily, and it grabs the RDB from the results set. That's just the instructions. All the RDB is saying, you got to go get this. This, this RDB is dependent on another one. Um, here's where you're going to go get your data. Here are the partitions. It's just instructions. It's not actually funny. And then you can feed that RDD to, in this case, we fed it to a first library, which is having multi learning statistics that we're running to the Spark uh, in the. We said, okay, well, run any SQL you want and compute multivariate statistics on it. That's kind of cool. Um, so now you've got some really advanced statistical tool for you. And then when you get the results back, Wrap them in a result set, so it actually returns based on SQL. So it actually looks nice. So this is a procedure that bundles in um, the machine learning libraries of Spark. What's really cool is the whole thing is run as a single Spark job. 
both the SQL underneath it and the machine learning library. So that if there's any failure or anything, you have the confidence in the job, which has the ability to do lineage and resiliency inside of it. So you're not decoupling, like, here's my query to get the data, and here's my machine learning, because I did that for years. We run this query, and okay, the query's good. Okay, now we're going to run our machine learning algorithm. Now we've assembled it, we broke all parallelization, we have to stream the data sequentially out. Now all of this is parallelized from the query. So the query still has its degree of parallelization as it's running through the system. And then that degree of parallelization is fed directly into the machine learning algorithm. So it's really powerful for running, you know, in essence, machine learning at scale. And then here's some of our SQL 99 coverage of th different things over here. I have an eye chart just to get you a sense of it is actually uh, real SQL. So that's what, and I know um, Sabash said you know, about 45 minutes, and I think we're a little over. So I wanted to give people a question, you know, an uh, opportunity to ask questions or uh, uh, chat about their experiences with this. Hopefully it was informative, but I was just trying to go into like why we did our stuff in Spark um, and some of the th challenges we had. So the big things were fix our key value store and taking compactions and putting them in Spark. Um, be able to support both transactional and analytical processing by using Spark as an analytical data flow engine. Um, really optimizing Spark with regard to input output formats and be able to do that. Um, bundling it gave us the ability to query not just HBase data, but to actually query um, just you know CSV files, Parquet files, stuff like that. Uh, allowed us to actually run queries against strings. Um, you know, it really, and I don't want to be Pollyannish about it, but it really did change the scope of our product and our ability to actually drive some value. It's an, it's a, it was impressive some of the features that it could do, from, you know, for us. What we're focused on now with Spark um, is really, you know, working through all the tungsten work, making sure it's integrated nice and splice machines so when you sort data, it's still using as low level of uh, representation ability that be cache efficient in sorts. So that's the project Tungsten that's been uh, worked on for quite some time. I know IBM was working with Databricks. There's a whole group that was really working on project Tungsten. Um, and we're incorporating that and tuning that um, and going through the supplies machine. So it's kind of an effort. Yes, sir. Uh, sure. So, first question is uh, does uh, the product use this example? Yeah, certified example. I feel a good example of that. Yeah, he did that. Yes. Yeah. And the uh, other question is how do you ingest the data? We talked about the product. Sure. We have a data in our EMS. We just want to move it. Sure. It's a great question. So, generally, if it's a large amount of data, um, you do an export in that system, and we have a bulk import tool that reads from HDFS. So, you put the files that you've exported from Oracle, MySQL, or whatever. Um, yeah, some people use Scoop. I know our services team use Scoop to do that. Um, other people use like an Informatica or whatever product they license. Um, they'll take the data, dump it out, put it into HDFS, and then import it into Splice Machine. And we have a bulk import tool that runs actually in Splice. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, I have a I'm sorry, I, I'm terrible. You have a large data warehouse and they want to move direction. You want to move direction. Just, just, just probably, I'm confused now. I have to use that. It's interesting. <laughs> um, so, we're kind of solving two different things, right? Redshift is a column restore that's optimized. Um, because data warehouse is better. Uh, it's on the cloud, it's robust, it's powerful, it has C-bolt. Right, no, and I, I know the guy that did that effort. So I, I it is a good prop from Par Excel, uh, where that came from. It's a solid columnar data store. Um, I don't think that's the future for data. Personally, I think the future of data is more the Oracle Exadata and SAP HANA model. Why I believe that. Why? So, so, yeah, so why do I believe that? I think the 
and, and go back to my first slides, this view of data management as there's these transactional systems, there's these operational data stores where we do operational reporting, there's a data warehouse, there's a columnar store. You do, but the challenge is you're still moving data from wherever this data is. So Redshift's not serving your website, I would suspect, yeah. correct? Right. So the problem is you have this huge amount of data movement that you're doing. And there's no big data data movement. It's really difficult because you're starting to do that. And then there's going to be delays in that data movement. So as business people, what they're saying is, well, gosh, you know, I, I, I'm using Gmail now. I'm using all these things. I can immediately interact with whatever data I have. And the expectation in, I think, the business marketplace is that whenever something happens, you should be able to analyze it. You should be able to apply algorithms to it. You should be able to um, have customer service interact with it. So you have all these really complex concepts. And the architectures of the past, in my mind, are the ones that said, you know, I'm going to run some sort of transaction that's going to be there. And then every night, we're going to move it over here. And then we're going to move it over here. And we get into that delay problem. So I'm not a, I think that'll change a bit. Now, to Redshift, I think it's really optimized um, for what it does, which is really efficient analytical queries. I don't think it's optimized for like data management, for example, applying like MDM or things that are doing data, um, like deduplication, um, you know, uniqueness constraints, foreign key constraints, the things you would do like in an operational data store. So I think the challenge we have is when you look at the way data is handled, it's handled in a lot of different ways. The transactional system has certain expectations. The people that are doing MDM and operational data stores, making sure your data is not completely junk, they have different ways that they interact with the data and different applications in the way that's, that they're doing it. And those usually also have applications like uh, customer service type applications that are going against that data in near real time. And then you have your warehouse, which has certain expectations and modeling expectations. And the problem is these are all, all are on the same platform. And the problem is you're spending all this time and money basically having many copies of all your data and moving it around, which is expensive, and maintaining these massive infrastructures for each piece. So yes, you can move to Redshift, an optimized columnar store for analytics, very good at that, um, and you know on the cloud. But you're still moving that data probably from some sort of operational data store cleansing type environment that you still have to maintain. And you still have your transactional database here. So if you look at it from a business perspective, I still have a delay in being able to interact with my data. Um, and if you're actually trying to fund this, it's still a pretty expensive environment with all of this. So that's kind of my perspective on that. Um, I also think, you know, when you, I think that's kind of the old way of looking at it is that a single system can't represent the data that's efficient for analytical and transactional processing. I don't think that's the data of the future, to be honest. That's my perspective. That's a belief. That's not a fact, by the way. I mean, that's just, that's just what I believe. Um, and I could be completely wrong. I just I see the stress that organizations have by doing it that way. And I just think something's got to get better there. Because there's like these expectations that are way out here and kind of my frustration is we're all delivering down here, and I'm like, what is going on? And you look at that architecture, and that's kind of causing us this tension, for lack of a better word. Um, so I'm hoping that architecture can change. Hopefully I answer your question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Picking up on his thread, um, in terms of sort of the relative, besides the technical and the understanding, have you actually loaded the same set of data into a database like Redshift and Splice Machine? We have, yeah, that's something. So on OLAP, you're looking, we're more like a Spark SQL type performance. So if you think of that, you're still performing <coughs> in a slower manner than the optimized stores uh, for that. That's just a fact. Um, so yeah, I don't think we'll be the fastest analytical database out there. That's not my vision at all. Um, my vision is more being able to commoditize a data management system um, that can still handle these types of workloads. Um, but for me, I think there's always going to be a place for like a Volt DB. So if you're a hedge fund, that's a great product for a hedge fund or somebody who's trying to write, you know, 
microsecond type delays and, and things. And you know, there, there's always going to be that far OLTP side. I think there's always going to be that far analytical processing optimization side. We're really in that middle where we're trying to go at what, what you know, to be honest, Oracle is always dominating. That's Oracle's dominant place right there. And that's where we've always tried, that's kind of where we want to try to you know, play and compete. Uh, yes. Uh, so oh, sorry, am I going to one? Just one more question. One more question. All right, good luck. Yeah. Uh, so coming from the audience, <coughs> yeah. not much of a big data background. Sure. How much of Spark, MapReduce, Google, Digital, or it seems like you could like, place your Google database with Spice Machine and you know, pretty much. Uh, be up and under the application, which also requires some. Well, I mean, the problem is there's no such thing as OLTP or OLAP. They always have some mixed workload characteristics with somebody running like an operational report or something. So, our goal when we build this is if you're used to running like an Oracle running that, um, you should be able to do it by a SQL and not have to know map reduce. You know, most of the people that work and interact with it on the Java, they don't you know Scala, whatever, they don't understand that stuff. So, it's really more about that. The key thing for our system is making sure you understand more of the database concepts. Um, you know, what kind of join strategy is appropriate? Or if our optimizer maybe makes a bad decision, do you understand? You know, well, I probably should have done this. Maybe I'll think about it. Um, so it's much more SQL based, and this is what I'm trying to say. Um, and that was our focus, because all the existing applications that are under stress in general are SQL based applications. And that's what we wanted to be able to not just say, hey, if you did like a two year development project, you could build a really cool app on us. You want to be able to say, you know that application you're running, maybe with tweaking a little bit of SQL, you can run on Spice Machine. If there's some sort of same kind of problem. That's kind of our strategy. Cool. All right, thanks guys for coming. Uh, we can, uh, I think John can be here for a little bit, so if you have any questions, you can ask him. And uh, if you don't mind, you can just help you know reset the chairs. Mm. Uh, it actually looks something like this. So I'm just gonna put it up over here. <laughs> oh, good gosh. Are you serious? Yeah, wow. It's, it's the round tables. It's like an arrow. Just you know, put them into an arrow and put the chairs around them. Thanks very much. I'll, I'll help you with this business. <laughs> you gotta get people to like raise their hands. If they go to IKEA. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh. Everybody can raise their hands. That's how you picture the Oh, I can't. Sure. Uh, well, how did you